Hey bud, how you doing? Welcome to Herp Corner. Here we are in the Red Rock Canyon, right by Las Vegas, Nevada, where we'll be talking about the common chakwala, also known as the northern chakwala, and Saromalis ater. I don't know. Uh, they were originally referred to by the Shoshone and Cahuilla as Chakswal, and also spelled Chakswal. The Spaniards transcribed this name as Chacahuala, and in Spanish, uh, Chacuala Norteña, again, which means northern Chacuala, and Cacharon de Roca, which roughly translates to rock puppy. Oh, see what you mean. It's clear to me that Mr. Auguste Dumeril, uh, the guy who discovered them in 1856, fell very much in love with these guys. Can't blame him either. I mean, you see them. Incredibly friend shape. Speaking of their shape, actually, though their coloration is greatly varying throughout their species, one variable that is incredibly consistent is their dumpy anatomy. This dumpy anatomy helps them maneuver their way through the dry, arid deserts of North and Central America. How so? Well, have you ever been told that a camel's humps are there to store water? First off, that's actually not true at all. Second off, that's one of the many benefits of being a fat lizard that's low to the ground. Their big, bulging stomachs retain moisture very well, as well as contributing to a higher surface area, which makes it easier to soak up more warmth in the sun. Uh, but also, they're more shaped like flat stones when they're tubby, so helps with camouflage. If you live in North and Central America, which, judging by my analytics, most of you are, uh, there's a high chance you're familiar with these fellas. The IUCN Red List judges these guys as least concern. Oh joy! They're generally pretty common in the drier areas, along with the other reptiles common to North America. The Chuck Wallet, short for Charles Wallace, is known mostly for his ability to explode. I say this because of the ability they possess to, when threatened, inflate their body an egregious amount. Chuck Wallace are effectively if the DeviantArt front page got to design a real animal. Jokes aside, this helps them when they lodge themselves in claustrophobic crevices, evade predators trying to reach in and yank them out. This is an especially useful tactic when they spend a majority of the year sitting alone in a cave somewhere. That's so sad! Uh, but it's true though. A majority of the time, if you go out looking for the species, you'll come up empty-handed. They're very cool and personable when you get to see them in person, but if you don't look during February, or any of the months directly after that, then you're going to be very disappointed. The reason they're so evasive during the cooler months is, simply put, because of the fact that they just love it hot. They just love it hot. Uh, this reflects in anything from the way they're taken care of in captivity to, uh, basically every single one of their adaptations that are unique to them. Except for the blowing up, of course, though even then, that's arguable. Their preference for much hotter weather, usually hanging around rocks as hot as 125 degrees Fahrenheit, or 51 degrees Celsius, uh, makes it so they're much less tolerant of cooler happenings. I don't know why I phrased it like that. Anytime they're in particularly lower temperatures, they tend to slow down their metabolism to quite the extreme degree, uh, much like most other cold-blooded species during the winter months. This is known to many as brumation. Though most of the land they're found, in, they're found on has the similarity of being incredibly dry or desolate or, at the very least, having plenty of places to hide, they're native to many different locales. Specifically, they can be found in the isolated islands residing in the Gulf of California. Specimens from there tend to exhibit a little something known as island gigantism, which refers to when populations become so disassociated from their origins that their evolution diverges into a much larger size. Basically, the island ones are much, much bigger. <laughs> They're 20 inches, uh, a little less than 2 feet, and tend to live up to 10 years in captivity. Uh, what I find strange, though, is the fact that in the wild they're estimated to live up to 15 years. Usually the longer lifespans are in captivity, due to, you know, limited predation and regular feeding times. Uh, what this divergence from the norm would suggest is the fact that we are not taking care of them quite right. Uh, it'd be useful to re-examine the care sheets and whatnot we put out if these estimated numbers are to be believed. Actually, scratch that. The oldest living Chukwala is 65 years old uh, and was raised in captivity. They vary wildly in lifespan depending on the care, I guess. 
Something notable would be the fact that it is widely debated whether or, uh, whether they are communal or not. Most lizards are com commonly thought to be territorial or protective of either their mates or their shelter. However, even if documentation of communal lizards in general is few and far between, it's still a nice surprise when there is a species like that. Uh, when resources aren't scarce and when it isn't mating season, chuck wallas can be found sharing hides, burrows, basking spots, and food. Otherwise, they'll commonly be found competing over such things. This takes shape in the very very familiar head bob, push-ups, or whatever you want to call the thing that bearded dragons do. When times are tight, they'll live under a self-established dominance hierarchy, which, unlike with most animals, isn't functionally dependent on the body sizes of the guys, instead more on how outwardly confident they are, which is just a funny way of saying aggression. On the topic of guys, uh, specifically in relation to girls, the common Charles Wallace is very sec subtly sexually dimorphic. Males are slightly larger in overall size, though that's an unreliable way of measuring. Uh, males have hemipenal bulges beneath the cloaca. Hemipenes are their two penises, and the hemipenal bulge is the result of having two penises. Uh, two penises that they attempt to modestly hide beneath their cloaca, that is. Uh, outside of that, there are also femoral pores, which will excrete pheromones that mark their territory, the chemical composition of which is yet to be documented. During breeding, they are, as previously stated, heavily aggressive in comparison to the usual docile nature of the species. They, as well as females, sexually mature within three years. Females themselves lack this cloacal bulge and femoral pores. Otherwise, it's rather difficult to tell between the sexes. They usually breed between April and May, uh, where the females will begin a gestation period of roughly one month. Uh, the little guys leave their eggs in a secure underground nest, usually a hole of sorts, somewhere with consistent temperatures and security. Unlike most species, uh, they don't leave the eggs directly after they're laid, but instead wait for the babies to hatch. They keep an eye on them in the meantime. Uh, they don't stop physically aging until around 25 years old, <laughs> to which it slows down drastically, and they then only grow 5.5 inches or so more. Uh, in the wild, despite their relatively large size, they're incredibly vulnerable. Like, incredibly, as well as despite their population size. Uh, after all, their bites aren't that bad, and their main defense is blowing up. They're incredibly vulnerable to the attacks of birds, coyotes, and other territory predators of their ecosystem. The overall survival rate of chuck wallas over the age of one year is around 75%. They're not doing too well. <laughs> yes. Okay. Hey, you're sure it's recording? Yeah, the little square inside the circle. Yeah, yeah, perfect. No, no, I, okay, just make sure. And there's a little timer ticking down? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, here we are in the actual Red Rock Canyon, um, where we'll be talking about the actual care of the Chukwala. Um We haven't found any so far, and that is because, let me tell you why, it is because it is currently the winter time uh, as of recording. And usually Chukwalas use this time to brumate, right? Uh, which, uh, depending on how skilled of a caretaker you are, may or may not be the best idea because you know brumation in general is a bit of a risky practice but th but that's besides the point uh point is here are the conditions that the chuckwalla is actually native to so so chuckwallas right uh, are not particularly fossorial right um and so what, what that would mean for the actual enclosure is although a loose substrate is okay it's not really necessary i'm not entirely sure how a uh, uh how an arid bioactive enclosure would work, but you could try it if that seems like your whole thing. Uh, in general, they like pretty dry conditions, usually a humidity of around, I'd say 73% at most. Definitely not in the high 80s. At that point, they could get a sinus infection. So you, I don't think you want that. Definitely make sure to have a good amount of things for them to climb on. I'd say that their care is comparable to a bearded dragon, just much harder, uh, much, much hotter and much more vertical. And also they're just faster. Chuck wallas are around the same size as a bearded dragon, just much less handleable, uh, which is not very good if your main intent on keeping a good beginner species is to handle them a lot. They don't really appreciate that. Though I have seen cases where people have good, uh, have uh, well socialized chakwalas, generally you're gonna need a lot of patience for that. <laughs> it's like a tokay gecko in that sense. In general though, focus more on verticality with the enclosure. And considering their big size, God, that would be a pretty large enclosure. <laughs> uh, I guess a, comparable to, visually, uh, two bearded dragon enclosures 
stacked up on each other so that they not only have uh, a good amount of verticality to work with but also a good amount of horizon is that the word you can also see around me here are a lot of uh, very very dry bits of foliage that's also something to keep in mind so if you do attempt to do a bioactive enclosure however the hell you manage to do that uh, make sure whatever kind of foliage you got is kind of like this you know you want to you want to do your best to replicate their uh wild environment in captivity so <laughs> if that seems like something you can do <laughs> maybe try it who knows um but god it's so beautiful here <laughs> another thing you'll notice about the uh wonderful uh luscious mountains of nevada i, I say luscious that implies that they're uh, thriving with life they don't look like it um is they're well not only are they very high but you can see all the nice cr uh, make sure and show the mountains all the nice nooks and crannies within them uh cracks and corners and i i took some footage earlier of some of the side of the mountain too you can tell there are like a million different hiding places uh in these very beautiful mountains for the chuckwalla uh which is especially good if you do brumate them but even if you don't excuse me even if you don't seems like the perfect place and i think they'd be very happy with you know <laughs> a lot of different stuff like that i've seen many people use uh silicone you know the spray on silicone stuff to create basically something like this huge huge mountains you know with nice little holes inside them nice little tunnel systems uh that would be very good to recreate though do keep in mind that as far as tunneling goes they don't make their own because i don't think it, i mean how would a chuckwalla even tunnel through uh solid rock i mean even though the sandstone here is is pretty easy to manipulate that's besides the point <laughs> uh aside from the actual looks of the enclosure chuckwallas are also primarily herbivorous which is something that sets them apart from the omnivorous bearded dragon um so you know that depending on where you stand on keeping actual uh keeping and breeding you know insects in captivity um it might be a little bit more difficult to care for an herbivorous species because that puts a lot more strain on <laughs> Uh, adding extra variety to their diet because that is like the top priority when it comes to feeding reptiles you know keeping a lot of good different sort of greens and the actual types of greens that a reptile is able to eat is quite limited as far as uh when to feed them i'd say definitely keep it uh, roughly the same if not more often as a bearded dragon considering you know if you're being fed uh greens all day then you're gonna need a lot more to actually eat your own weight right uh, that that's though that is under the assumption that they need to eat their own weight which is up for de up for debate considering you know reptiles can slow down their uh digestive system and whatnot so that, that can make meals last longer in their actual digestive tract but that's besides the point that's beside that's for you to decide right uh point is though feed them a lot of greens and a lot of different varieties of it right oh jesus there's so much here uh, as far as uh keeping water in the actual enclosure goes if you're going for a more naturalistic enclosure which i would highly recommend um a lot of the water here seems to be of a high ph level because of how dirty it is there's a lot of you know gunk in it because it seems to me like they rely mostly on the water collected in the holes of rocks which is you know pretty commonplace for uh, wild reptiles uh, so if you want to replicate the kind of pH level that they're familiar with in the wild that is a little extra I don't think you need to do that necessarily but it, it's always a good idea um, yes outside of uh, kind of unneeded complexities when it comes to doing their enclosure and whatnot uh, I definitely I definitely recommend them as a beginner species though here's the thing they're not as beginners of a species they're not as easy to get and keep as a bearded dragon is uh, but they're not such a moderate species as a let's say crocodile skink right um because they're not super finicky they're just not good with handling you know uh they're very hardy though and they're very large <laughs> which may also uh complicate things in terms of you know enclosure size and whatnot however they are commonly bred and kept in captivity. That is something that if you look up chuckwallas for sale, then you're gonna get a lot of different results, right? So that doesn't necessarily complicate things. Um, I definitely say that they're a good beginner species if you're looking to get something more exotic, but uh, <laughs> the, a lot of the times beginners are more likely to gravitate towards reptiles that you can actually handle. So if, if you don't wanna handle, if you don't wanna not handle your reptile, no. You don't you don't want it you don't need it uh but that's it for this segment uh that that's the general care of them it's a very beautiful place here uh uh, uh, uh back to the uh, uh yes and then you can end the, end the recording 
and then sure, yeah, yeah, sure. You can show, yeah, just go, just go crazy with it. Yeah, look at that. Look at those babies. Uh, now, before we wrap up, here's two truths and a lie about the Charles Wallace. Let's see if you were paying attention. A. The oldest living Chuckwalla is 25 years old. B. The Chuckwalla defends itself by blowing up. And C. The Chuckwalla cares for their eggs. Which one was the lie? Feel free to comment down below. And don't you dare cheat! If you cheat, I will not hesitate to Google porn. Uh, I think that's going to be it for this episode. As always, sources will be in the description. If you're interested in the topic, I'd recommend looking further into their husbandry or history. If you like what I do in no a specific reptile or amphibian you'd like to see me cover, put it in the comments. Chances are, if you've made it to the end, you're probably like me, hyperfixating like crazy on reptiles. Uh, well, if that's the case, then this is the perfect channel for you. Feel free to subscribe since I do these every other week. Like the video to support the channel. Have a good evening, morning, or afternoon. Thank you for listening, watching, whatever, and I'll see you next time. By the way, the lie was answer A. The oldest living Chuckwalla is actually 65 years old. Um, 25 years old is only when they stop aging. Although, usually, the, uh, in captivity, they don't live past 15. Um, but that's besides the point. Point is, the oldest living Chuckwalla is roughly 65 years old. Okay, have a good night.